And I want to welcome those of you here today on behalf of the Schiller Institute. And thank you for joining us tonight. So my name is Keisha Rogers, and I'm a former Democratic nominee for US Congress and a member of the National LaRouche Policy Committee. And I've led a continued campaign, national campaign, in the efforts to defend our space program against the egregious attacks and the cuts to the space program, including our manned space program, and to rally the scientific community and the population, uh, those who really witness and, and gain great benefit uh, around the country and around the world. Uh, from the developments of our space program and have, have been inspired by the space program, but to rally the scientific community again to be an inspiration to the Americans and to the world in furthering the fight for our future in space. So what I'd like to do first of all is to just start off with some brief remarks and following that, the plan for tonight is just to get feedback from all of you um, to have members of the scientific community and the population that are here tonight, uh, particularly the uh, scientific community, to share your experiences uh, here and you know what we can really do to inspire the population again to recognize that the space program is our future and we need desperately to save it and to bring it back again. Um, and I hope that this meeting will be a stepping stone for something much greater, including the idea of uh, I'd like to have a larger conference in recognizing, one, that we need a National Space Day here in the United States uh, centered around our first moon landing. So um, we have to go out and organize the population and our, our political figures as to why that's absolutely critical today. So let me just start by saying that we're here tonight uh, to celebrate a, a great achievement 55 years ago of the anniversary of the beginnings of America in space. And as many of you know, on May 5th, 1961, uh, that's the day that American astronaut Alan Shepard took a 15-minute suborbital flight into space um, on the Freedom 7 spacecraft. And Alan, uh, Alan Shepard was the second man in space following Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Uh, and Shepard was chosen as a member of the first seven astronauts for NASA, which was a part of the Mercury 7 mission, which people may remember. Uh, the Mercury 7 mission uh, was announced in uh, April 9th of 1957. And I'm sure most of you in this room can probably even uh, name me the other six of those, uh, but we'll, we can do that later. Or those, anybody in these, this room who actually worked with any of those seven people, um, I would like to hear about the, those stories later. But uh, one thing that I found exciting, and I think that it's important to note that although the garden was the first man in space um, with the Russian, Russian cosmonaut uh, first to orbit the Earth. One thing that I find incredible about our accomplishments here in America is that the space program was made from its beginning in the United States a part of the public. Most people didn't know, I think it was about 10 years later, that the Garland, uh, it was discovered that he actually orbited. Um, but you know, we inspired Americans and we inspired the world. Uh, the fact that on April 9th, 1957, when the Mercury 7 was announced, it was announced on national TV and it was a great stepping stone for all the world to see. Uh, John Glenn uh, made the first orbit uh, for in, first Amer uh, in his first orbit, excuse me. Uh, there again, the population was there to see and celebrate. And then you find that the remarkable feat that came about from uh, all the accomplishments and the hard work and the commitment to this great vision and great visionaries came about with the development 
or should I say with America becoming the first to land a man on the moon. And despite all the odds, realize the challenge of President John F. Kennedy on July 6, 1969, um, as Kennedy called for landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. This is something, again, that the entire world rejoiced in the great achievements of and was looked at as a great advancement for all of mankind. So I find, it, again, it's quite fitting uh, people who don't know or, you know, that the Apollo 11 mission uh, when Neil Armstrong, uh, Buzz Aldrin, and uh, one of my favorites, uh, Michael Collins, who a lot of people leave out, <laughs> went to space. Um, the, first, the plaque that the astronauts left there was, we came in peace for all mankind. So that's, that should be, once again, our mission, to come in peace for all mankind. And that should be the mission of our space program. Now, I just want to say that I actually just wrote a statement uh, which has been published in our Executive Intelligence Review magazine. And uh, if you're not a subscriber to EIR, uh, you definitely are missing out. And you should become a subscriber. Uh, and the statement is a unified mission for the common aims of mankind. You can pick up a copy over there uh, on the literature table. And in the statement I call, you know, really on the scientific community to restore their commitment to the future of our nation in the advancements of the exploration of space. That this is not going to be done by gimmicks, cheap gimmicks, uh, but only through real leadership. And you know, we find that there's a lot of cheap gimmicks going on out there. People want to make side cuts, uh, thinking that we can um, turn the space program into some kind of some kind of marketplace for you know going into space and making it a tourist attraction or amusement park. Amusement park, <laughs> exactly. And that is not what our space program represents. So. Now, what we have to look at is we need the type of leadership to fight for our space program as the type of President John F. Kennedy, or those visionary leaders like Kraft Erica, who was a great space pioneer, and people, someone who I have mentioned a lot, uh, who recognized that space was a mission for mankind, that it was our duty, our prerogative, to actually advance uh, beyond Earth and go out into the solar system, because this is where we were going to learn how to better improve our conditions uh, here on planet Earth, and how to better understand our own creative powers as human beings. Because there, as Kraft Erica said, there is nothing and no one under the natural stars of the universe, uh, of the solar system, that can uh, put limitations on mankind except man himself. And I think that's absolutely true, uh, that we have to stop putting the limitations on ourselves and to actually start to uh, move forward with our mission in the conquest of space. So, and Kennedy said, that where there is no vision, the people will perish. Now, I have to tell you, perish is just the direction we're heading in under this collapsing financial system and under uh, the direction of the current administration, the collapsing transatlantic financial system and the push toward total, total war and chaos that we're seeing right now. Um, you know, you, you think about, right now, we are in a complete war-intensified situation. You know, we're continuing uh, the escalation toward war against what should be some of our great allies, China, putting uh, uh, aircraft carriers and uh, missile defense systems right in the South China Sea, on the border of Russia right now. Um, this is a problem because 
we should be committing ourselves to actually collaborating together as human beings in the fight for increasing the understanding of who we are as human beings. And that's what the space program represents. You know, it's, it's very interesting that on April 24, China celebrated its first national space day. You know, joining with Russia, who celebrates the, uh, on April 12th, the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. And, you know, as I said, said in my statement, I wrote that, you know, the United States right now is steady and spaced out. We don't have a space day. We have people who are completely spaced out, who are not <laughs> thinking, <laughs> thinking about the fact that our nation once represented an inspiration for the world. Now we're bullies to the world. We're, the world is afraid of us because we're not inspiring. We're starting wars, economic collapse, you know, wanting to be the great hegemonic, uh, you know, uh, world power, should I say? And that's not what the United States was represented under the vision of Kennedy, of Franklin Roosevelt, and going back to our founding fathers of Alexander Hamilton. That's the world we need, uh, the nation we need again today. And so, but you think about, you know, why is it that China and Russia have a space day? Well, it's really not just to celebrate an individual event or an individual person. Uh, you know, they are celebrating their respective national space days because they want to celebrate the achievements of uh, they want to celebrate the achievements of a nation and its commitment to the future of mankind, to those children not yet born yet, to the advances in science that are yet to be discovered, the, the advances and discoveries that still awaits us. That's why we have a National Space Day. And, you know, thinking about where we have already what we've already achieved, the landing of a man on the moon, the now China is going to do something even more remarkable, which is that they're, not, they're now going to be the first nation to put a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. Um, now think about that one. <laughs> they're calling for, uh, the increased development of, of helium-3. So the United States has to renew its commitment, and China and making this announcement that it's going to do something that no nation has yet to do, uh, land the man on the far side of the moon, <coughs> this should be a wake-up call to the United States that we should be joining in this effort. You know, and the fact that you have insane politicians who say we shouldn't be working with China in the development of space, you know, this is gonna set us back a long way. We gotta push for legislation and leadership who are, are going to uh, fight now to reverse this policy that the United States should not be working uh, with nations such as China. So, <coughs> Now, let me just say, I was uh, just reading Dean Kranz's book here. If you haven't seen this, this is very, uh, it's called, called Failure is Not an Option, Mission Control from Mercury to Apollo and Beyond, excuse me, <laughs> and Beyond. Uh, but, you know, in, in this book, he's talking about the commitment and the fight led by members of our uh, space program at the time um, in the Apollo mission and so forth against the ending of the Apollo mission and uh, those, and, uh, and also those who said then, against those who said then as they do today, oh, we don't have the resources for that, we don't have the money to go into space, you know, uh, that's just complete lies because we have the money to build more new, uh, nuclear arsenal. We have the money to push 
billions of dollars more bailouts to the financial leaders, and we have money to, you know, go to more wars and do all of these other things. But, you know, it was a case that when the Apollo mission was being attacked, uh, as we were continuing to spend more money uh, at that time in the Vietnam Wars and uh, taking away again a vision, you know, and this came about with the uh, assassination of President John F. Kennedy. After President Kennedy died, there was a fight to keep his commitment alive. And, you know, today we see that it's completely been ripped apart. And you know, one of the people when I was telling you earlier about that China is now committing itself to landing on the far side of the moon, do you guys know that we had this mission, there were people working uh, with Krantz, uh, working with former astronaut Harrison Smith, and um, who were actually putting together stats for the United States to be the first to land on the far side of the moon. Uh, Smith, uh, one of the former astronaut of the Apollo 17 mission, was actually one of the leading advocates for the United States doing this, along also with the United States um, re realizing the importance of the mining of helium-3 on the moon. And now, that was never able to be realized. And with the direction we're going in and the current policy of the administration, it may not be able to be realized. We have to actually fight for a commitment to a unified national mission. The moon is just the place to do that. Most all nations right now recognize that, including um, India, who has just also announced its commitment to development and research for the mining of helium-3 on the moon. And the develop, you know, the, the development of the lunar surface. Most nations, as I said, recognize is the key to success of any type of further mission in space, including the Mars mission or a mission to any other planetary body. So, let me. One thing I wanted to do is just had a quick quote here from Francis' book that I wanted to read. And then I'm gonna open up for discussion in just a second here. So, uh, in the course of describing the, the fight around the ending of the Apollo mission, uh, Jean Kranz says, the space program was also suffering. The lunar program was coming to an end with the cancellation of the last Apollo missions, 18, 19, and 20, I felt betrayed. It was as if Congress was ripping our hearts out, gutting the program we had fought so hard to build. Leadership is fragile. It is more a matter of mind and heart than resources. And it, is, and it seemed that we no longer had the heart for those things that demanded discipline commitment, and risk. It's very true today. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, additional developments that I can speak on tonight, um, and probably some of you guys in, in the room can tell me about as well, uh, in terms of the direction the world is taking right now, particularly nations like China, Russia, India, that have committed themselves to the advancement of, of mankind in space. This is the economic driver for the world. Um, this has to be the economic driver once again for the United States. And I think we have to realize that it's in our national interest and the interest of the world that we the United States commit ourselves again to a unified national mission in the exploration of space. And I think that we can do it if we just choose to fight. So let me just stop there. And um, as I said, 
what I'd like to hear is where people see the future of our nation, um, how we can actually come together and make sure that we can rally the American people to recognize that this is their future. This is not just some side issue here. And this is something I've been fighting for uh, for some time, probably not as long as some of you in the room here. Uh, but I think that we need to actually start to get people to realize, you know, this the whole political spectrum right now is just a joke. If you're not talking about this, there are not meetings and discussions from the political candidates, presidential candidates, about the future of our nation in space. What are you talking about? So that's what we should discuss here today, and I think the message will get around, and you should tell all your friends, hey, you know, somebody's fighting. <laughs>